Good morning, men. Please turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Four months ago, I was having a conversation with a, a really good friend. And during the course of that discussion, he said to me, I don't feel like people care about me, only what I can do for them. And I was flabbergasted. I, I mean, I know that I care very much about him. I know his wife very well, and I know she loves him to death. I know his children. I know they idolize him and love him deeply. He's a small business owner. His employees, they really care about him uh, tremendously. I'm not, I'm a customer of his, and I also know some of his other customers, and I know that they not only appreciate what he is doing for them, but uh, have great respect for him and love him as a, as a person. So how does that happen and what can we do about it? Because I think a lot of us would have those kinds of thoughts and other similar thoughts as well. We're going to start a new series today called The Four Voices. Subtitle for the series, How to Think Like a Christian. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to over, overview these four voices. So the title of today's message is, you know, what's going on inside your head? The first thing we want to talk about in this particular message is how that conversation in your head is a lot more than just self-talk. We know that we all have a conversation going on in our heads all the time, self-talk. However, that's not the only thing that's going on up there. There are other voices, four other voices in our heads as well that are also trying to influence what we think, say, and do. And some of them are trying to get us off track. So in this series, we want to take a look at that. We'll begin by overviewing those four voices. The first voice is the world. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, where you hopefully have your Bibles open to. It says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human traditions and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. How does this work? The world will tell you that you're too young to make a difference. I remember when I was first getting started, how I was told that maybe you did have a lot of promise, but you don't have enough gray hair and people will never listen to you. So they told me the world, the voice of the world was saying, you're too young. Then, you know, as you get older, people tell you that, well, you're not useful anymore. You have been expended and so now you're expendable. So you can't make a difference. So here's, here's the way the world speaks. It doesn't make any difference if you're young or old. You really can't make any difference. The world's trying to tell you that you can't make a difference. The Holy Spirit, through the Bible, is telling a very different story. Joseph, David, Jesus, they all started their careers when they were 30 years of age, when they were young men and had a tremendous impact. Moses, Joshua, Paul, they all did their best work. They all played their best music in the last one third of their lives. They were late bloomers. I've got a, a book here called Late Bloomers, the stories of 75 people who made tremendous contributions in the, the later years of their lives. People like Truman, all the way from the presidency, all the way to Kentucky Fried Chicken, Colonel Harlan Sanders. So the voice of the world wants to tell you that you can't make it make a difference. And that's an example of how human traditions and the elemental spiritual forces of this world try to uh, influence the narrative that's inside of your head. The second voice that we want to take a look at in this overview, we'll do a deep dive on each of these four voices in the weeks ahead. But the second voice, the first one's the world, the second one is the flesh or the sinful nature. Romans chapter 8, verse 5. If you have a Bible, you might want to look at this. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. 
The mind governed, or the narrative governed by the flesh, is death. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. Well, how does the voice of the flesh work? Well, it might be uh, in a very personal relationship like a marriage. So recently I had an experience with my wife. I was feeling down, feeling like things weren't going the way they were supposed to be going. And so because I'm sinful, because of the fall, we all have this sinful nature. We all have this flesh. Because of the fall, my first reaction is, it's her fault. Uh, you know, she's not meeting my needs. I took a few days, though, and instead of acting on the voice in my head, the, the flesh was telling me that it was her fault, I took a few days and sorted through that to get back to, you know, what is the voice of God in this? And I realized that what was happening to me was happening because of my childhood experience, some of the nurture that I had or the lack of nurture that I had, and the way that I want to uh, blame others for something that's going on in my life. So I realized, and this is a great metaphor, I hope it maybe can help you in your marriage or some other relationships. The metaphor that popped into my mind is, is that, okay, I, I've stumbled here. I haven't fallen to the ground, but I have stumbled. But my wife didn't trip me. I tripped myself. It's my own sinful nature. It's my own flesh. So I was able to, instead of blaming my wife and telling her that it was her fault, which is what my sinful nature wants to do, the flesh, I was able to tell her, okay, Patsy, I have stumbled here and I need you. I need you to reach out your hand and grab my arm and steady me so that I don't fall to the ground. Huge difference. So the first voice is the world. The second voice is the flesh. The third voice is the devil. John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus is speaking and he says, the devil was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So the devil wants to destroy what God wants to build. The malware of choice for the devil is doubt. And once the devil is able to load this malware onto your brain, onto the hard drive of your brain, that is a virus that spreads very quickly. So some of the thoughts that you might end up uh, having is that it's no use. I'll never be good enough. Truth is, you never really will be good enough. And the devil uses that uh, to so the, the doubt, take the shame and the guilt that you fear, feel for the things that you've done and convince you that no matter how hard you work, you'll, you'll never earn enough merit to be good enough. One of my seminary professors, Dr. McKenzie, said it takes a lot of truth to float an error. It really irks the devil no end when a man comes to the conclusion that it really is true that he will never be good enough and that he needs to rely on the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to take on the burden of all the shame and the guilt and to forgive him of his sins. So that's the third voice that's speaking into our heads. The, the first is the world, the flesh, the devil. And then the fourth voice that's in our head is the Holy Spirit. John 14, 26, one of my all-time favorites, Jesus is speaking, and he says, But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, teach you all things, and remind you of everything I have told you. Wow, what an incredible promise. So there's nothing new going on in the world. Only the Holy Spirit 
can remind you of that. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11 says that God is working out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. Everything. Only the, the voice of the Spirit through the Word of God can calm us when we look at current events and just look at all the chaos that's out in the world right now, uh, especially in 2020. It's amazing. But the voice of the Holy Spirit can calm us in all these things. So these are the four voices that are in our heads. The conversation is affected by these four voices, the world, the flesh, the devil, and the Holy Spirit. Now I want to give you the big idea and the premise for the entire series. Here it is. The four voices are the world, the four voices in your head, are the world, the flesh, the devil, and the Holy Spirit. Your job is to figure out which one is speaking and make the adjustment. So I want to leave that up on the screen for a minute so you can write that down. And I'll say it again. The four voices in your head are the world, the flesh, the devil, and the Holy Spirit. Your job is to figure out which one is speaking and make the adjustment. Next, you can take control of the narrative in your head. Please turn with me now to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Proverbs 4, 23. Which says, above all else, guard your heart. When it, the Bible says something like above all else, that's very significant, above all else, of all the things that could be said in the scripture. So why does it say that? Well, we know that the Hebrew word for heart literally means the inner man. Technically, the intellect, the mind, uh, the will, and then the emotions, all of the things that make up the, the inner man. Today, we probably would talk more about the mind than, than the heart, but the idea is that it's everything that's within us. And the Bible says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So these voices in our head are affecting the narrative that is in our brain and God has given us the ability to take control of that narrative. When he says, above all else, guard your heart, he would not tell us to do that if he would not also equip us to be able to do it. Why does he say that we should guard our hearts? Because of the fall, we are very vulnerable to being hacked. We are very vulnerable to being burglarized. What would an unguarded heart look like? An unguarded heart might look like an unguarded house. In my neighborhood, we've had a few burglaries over the years. My wife and I have taken steps to protect ourselves. If someone knocks on the door, we don't automatically open it. We keep our windows locked. We have floodlights on a sensor. We have a burglar system. I spent about $100 and bought some video cameras. So we have video surveillance. I put a light on a timer in one of the front rooms so it goes off in the middle of the night. And if there, a burglar was out there casing the place, you would get a little bit of a, a sense that somebody was in the house. I found a fake TV device that Basically, you plug it in, close the curtain, and from the outside, it looks like there's a, a TV flashing in the room that somebody's inside. We have a, a yappy little dog who goes berserk. I would never want to burglarize my house with that yappy little dog. And then we have a, a put everything that we have of value, which is really just papers, into a safe deposit box. My wife doesn't have any jewelry. jewelry. We don't have any art. But whatever we do have it of any value, we, we put it in a safe deposit box. So we have taken the steps, we've been intentional about guarding our house. 
And that's exactly what God is telling us above all else, guard your heart, just like we guard our house, guard your heart. Use that same intentionality to do that. And he has given us through the spirit, the power to do that. Self-control, the self-control to uh, take charge of the narrative in our head He's given us the power through his Holy Spirit to do that. Self-control is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The big idea today, the four voices in your head are the world, the flesh, the devil, and the Holy Spirit. Your job is to figure out which one is speaking and then make the adjustment. You can control the narrative that's in your head. Finally, today, how can you start mastering the four voices? How can you start mastering those four voices right now? In the handout that you've been given today, the third question has a list of some different situations in which you might find yourself. Uh, and there's a, a simple exercise there. We'll do some other exercises. This just is really to get you started. And the idea is to figure out what is your normal state of mind in these different situations? Are you mad, glad, sad, bad? Do you feel like you're underappreciated, uh, appreciated, loved, unloved? Do you, like my friend, do you feel like um, nobody really cares about you on a personal basis? How is it that you feel? Then there is another column on this question for you to think through, maybe over the next few days, what voice is speaking that makes you feel that particular way? So this is a very powerful exercise for you to, to get started, to be thinking about how these four voices might be uh, speaking into the narrative that's inside your head. And then the other thing that uh, you can start doing today to help master these four voices is to be vulnerable in your neighborhood crime watch group, your small group, to feel free to share more openly uh, you know, what's really going on inside your head. Like my friend, I don't, he said, I don't feel like people care about me only what I can do for them. Do you feel that way? If so, let your group know. Let them affirm you, encourage you, reassure you. I did this myself. I have been mentoring a young man. We finished up one of our sessions about 10 minutes early. So I said, hey, can I just tell you a little bit about what's been going on with me lately? So I was able to talk through... Uh, some of the difficulties I've been facing with a, an autoimmune disease has lasted for three years now. And just some of the health problems in, in our family. My wife's um, mother has gone on to hospice care. I'm the executive assistant to my wife, who's the executor of uh, everything that belongs to her mother. When her father passed away, uh, not long before that, he asked me if I would help her. And so basically I make, co make coffee and uh, co copies for her. I was making some copies one day and somebody had forgotten to push the fit the page button. And so I made 20 pages uh, of this document that my wife wanted photocopied, grabbed it out of the hopper and ran downstairs to put it on her desk. And about halfway down there, I noticed that uh, because they had not put pushed the fit the page button, that the right two inches had been cut off. And so the document that I had printed was useless. And I just had a meltdown. I went, I, I'm glad my wife wasn't in the house, but I was enraged by that. And I said, something's really wrong. And so that's why I wanted to talk to my friend and unburden myself. And it was amazing. In 10 minutes time, the cloud had lifted, whatever, all these things that have been accumulating over the last three years, they just disappeared. So you can do that too with a small group, a friend. They can help you understand what's going on 
inside your head and make the adjustment. The big idea, the four voices in your head are the world, the flesh, the devil, and the Holy Spirit. Your job is to figure out which one is speaking and make the adjustment. I look forward to doing deep dives on these voices with you in the weeks ahead. Let's go ahead and pray. Our dearest Father, Lord, I thank you for how you have revealed in Scripture the different voices that are trying to influence the narrative in our head and that how you have given us your Holy Spirit and power to uh, sort out the narrative and to walk in the fullness of your power. Lord, I pray that uh, the men who are listening to this message or ever will listen to it will understand that there are these four voices in their head, the world, the flesh, the devil, and the Holy Spirit, and that their job is to figure out which voice is speaking and make the adjustment. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Men, thank you for being with us today. I love you and see you next time. I want to read from the book of Philippians, chapter number four, verse six. Hear the word of God. Be anxious for nothing, Paul is instructing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, this is asking, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. When I look at that verse, I see two things that immediately come out. Number one, the Lord is telling us, don't be anxious. Now, I don't know about you, but we have to fight to not be anxious. Do you ever feel anxious? I mean, when things happen in life that we feel are out of our control, the natural human tendency is to be anxious about it. But the Word of God is telling us, guard your heart. Be anxious for nothing, but rather, Make your request, your supplication, be made known to God with thanksgiving. So I just want to encourage us today. There's probably things in your life right now that you're anxious about. Maybe, maybe some of you are students right now and you're anxious about your exams or you're anxious about something that's going on in college. Maybe somebody else is anxious about a health concern that you or somebody in your family has. Maybe it's money. It could be anything. Whatever it is that you're dealing with, Let's just take a step back. Let's just pause for a second and say, Father God, I realize that I'm falling short of your word. That, Father, your word tells me, be not anxious. But, Father, I am anxious. Help me today. I lift this concern up to you right now. And whatever that concern is, you just lift that up to the Lord right now. Say, Father, I ask you to strengthen me with your peace right now. Because you have promised to be active in my life as I include you in my life and ask you to be active in my life. And Father, I also want to come to you right now with the spirit of thanksgiving, thanking you for all the things that you've already done in the past. Father, I'm asking you now to give me faith in this situation. And Father, I repent of anxiety. Help me to guard my heart from it. God bless you, beloved. Pass this on to a friend. Somebody probably needs to hear it. Until next week, this is Rabbi Schneider saying, I love you and shalom. Good morning, men. Please turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 1, verse 20. The series is the four voices. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. The subtitle for the series is How to Think Like a Christian. The premise for the series, the four voices, in your head in addition to your own voice. In other words, we all have self-talk that we do all the time, but we're not the only voice up there. There are four other voices up there too that are trying to influence what we think, say, and do. And so the four voices in your head are the world, the flesh, the devil, and the Holy Spirit. Your job is to figure out which one is speaking and make the adjustment. Today, we want to take a look at the voice of the world. One of my favorite authors is Pascal. This is uh, his most well-known book, perhaps, Pensee, which means thoughts 
in uh, English. And as you can see, I kind of own this book, or maybe, or maybe the book owns me, I'm not sure. Thought number 148 says this, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who go and hang themselves. He teases this out a little bit. You know, one man goes to war, one man does it, does not go to war, but they both do it for the same reason, because they think that that's the thing that's going to make them happy. So I want to go ahead and give you the big idea for this session. And it's what the voice of the world is saying. The big idea, the world says, it's going to take a lot more than Jesus to make you happy. It's going to take a lot more than Jesus to make you happy. And now I want to take a look at how this came about by first talking how the world, about how the world is trying to get inside of your head. Romans chapter 1 verse 20 tells us how it began. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. And then it goes on to say that although people knew God, they didn't glorify him and they didn't give him thanks. And as a result, their minds became futile and their thinking foolish and they exchanged the glory of God for idols, the truth of God for lies. They worship created things instead of the creator. The cumulative effect of all that, what Francis Schaeffer calls the domino effect of the fall, all of these hundreds of millions of small decisions that have been made as we worship created things, as we believe the lie, as we make the idol, leaves us with the world that we have today. And we look around and the, the culture that we have today is very far from God. Just look at the racial injustice that we're dealing with, uh, the disease that we're dealing with. Think about sexual violence. Did you know that if you have a daughter and send her to college, there is a 26% chance that she's going to be sexually violated? The institution of marriage has been virtually gutted. According to Pew Research, 85% of Americans today think it's fine for a man and a woman to live together and not be married. In fact, 69% of them think it's okay if they plan to live together and never get married. It's a culture that's moved very far away from uh, God. I wrote in the book, The Christian Man, about the world in this way. The fallen world is a never-sleeping juggernaut that relentlessly crushes everything in its path without pity. So at some point, a man begins to feel the gravity of all this, the weight of all this, and he cries out to God looking for help. He hears about the gospel of Jesus. The world fights back and the world basically speaks with this voice. The world says it's going to take a lot more than Jesus Christ to make you happy. Look at how I can make you happy, says the world. Money will solve your problems. Uh, success will make you happy. A dynamic career will give you meaning. Um, you're doing this for your family. Oh, and by the way, if you're a Christian, you can have the best of both worlds. You can have your uh, cake and eat it too. You can have the best of both worlds. And even if you're a biblical Christian, uh, the world will still... Uh, uh, try to convince you that that whatever happiness that you do, do have, you need to perform in order to deserve to continue to get that grace. So the world is basically filled with lies, all on the foundation of uh, moving away from 
God's uh, invisible qualities, his eternal power, his uh, divine nature. I actually got out of pro ball a year earlier than my brother. I went through the identity crisis a year before he did. He still had a lot to learn. Fortunately, I was able to find him a job at this school as a janitor. Tell him about it. <laughs> I went in a six month period of time from swinging a bat in front of thousands of people to pushing a broom in front of nobody. And that was a time where God really broke me of my identity. I loved being a professional baseball player. I loved the platform it gave me to minister as a platform for the gospel. But you know what? I had to learn that there is no difference between swinging a bat in front of thousands of people or pushing a broom in front of nobody. God just wants us to be faithful with whatever He's put in our hand. And it was very important for me to learn that I am a human being, not a human doing. What I do does not define me, but who I am in Christ, no matter what tool He puts in my hands, really matters most. And so the focus for us needs to not be on what I need to do. It needs to be on who have I become in Christ Jesus. Whether I'm changing diapers, teaching a fifth grade class, writing books, or speaking to thousands, it doesn't matter. We just need to be faithful to be who it is that God's made us to be. So whatever tool God has placed in your hand, be the person God's called you to be. Next, the reason that this voice works is because often men don't understand that this is not the problem that Jesus came to fix. Jesus did not come to change the fallen world. Jesus did not come to restore the fallen world to its pre-fallen state. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus said, my kingdom is from another place. My kingdom is not of this world. Jesus did not come to restore the kingdoms of men. That doesn't mean that we should not work for the betterment of this world. Jesus certainly did. He uh, healed the sick. He uh, fed the poor. So by all means, let's try to find a solution to racial injustice and bring reconciliation. By all means, let's try to find a vaccination for COVID-19. By all means, let's uh, build houses, settle down, marry, have children, and work for the peace and the prosperity of the towns where we have been exiled. But restoring the world to its pre-fall state is not what the gospel is all about. The purpose of the gospel is to help men make sense of what's going on in the world and then give them hope through Jesus Christ. The creation has been groaning since the very beginning. Uh, it's been subjected to futility. And the purpose of the gospel is to liberate you and me from our bondage to decay and bring us into the glorious freedom of the children of God. And so here's the question for you. Is that enough for you? Is that gospel enough for you? The world says it's going to take a lot more than Jesus Christ to make you happy. But the truth of the gospel is, is that you're not going to find the happiness that you're looking for in this world anyway. Most of us are familiar with the famous serenity prayer that's used in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. It's from... Reinhold Niebuhr. He is a professor at Union College, Union Theological Seminary, rather. Uh, 
he died in the last one third of the last century. In 1950, they finally published this prayer. I'm going to give you the um, first verses of it, which you will recognize. God, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that should be changed, and the wisdom to know the difference. But then the rest of his poem goes on and says this, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace, taking as he, meaning Jesus, taking as he did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. The world says, though, it's going to take a lot more than Jesus Christ to make you happy. Next, I want us to talk about how to keep the world out of your head. The verse that we overviewed last time for the world was Colossians 2.8, which says, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than in Christ. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. What Colossians 8, uh, 2 verse 8 is describing, uh, the hollow and deceptive philosophy, is describing the pattern of this world. What uh, we talked about uh, beginning with Romans 1.20 and just how the world is, is evolved into a culture that's very far from God, that's the pattern of this world. Uh, Romans 12.2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That sounds a lot like guard your heart for everything you do flows from it, doesn't it? So do not conform to the pattern of this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and then watch this. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, also helps us to understand how we can keep the, the voice of the world out of our head. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So we keep this voice of the world out of our heads by understanding that everything in the world comes from the Father, not from the Father, but it comes from the world. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. So how do we keep the voice of the world out of our head? Well, we do it in the word of God, taking our thoughts captive, uh, not being uh, taken captive by hollow and deceptive philosophy, but rather to the obedience of Christ. And we don't conform to the pattern of the world, but we allow the gospel of Jesus to transform our lives. So Jesus said that, you know, we're in the world. He, in John chapter 17, when he's praying to his father, he said, Father, I'm not taking them out of the world. I'm leaving them in the world. So we are in the world, but not of the world. Another way of thinking about this is that we are aliens and strangers. We are pilgrims. We're passing through. This is not our, this is not our real home. 
This is a, a temporary abode for us. Uh, our bodies re, are referred to as, as tents. Uh, we're referred to as jars of clay. It's against this backdrop that the world is trying to convince you that it's not enough. It's not enough. Uh, I can give you money. I can give you success. I can give you prestige. I can give you power. Uh, I, can, I can even give you uh, religious credibility. I can make people think you're really special because you know so much about God. But at the end of the day, the big idea is <laughs> that this voice of the world is uh, not from God. Uh, the voice of the world says, the world says, uh, that it's going to take a lot more than Jesus Christ to make you happy. My question for you, of course, is, uh, is that true for you? Is it going to take more than Jesus Christ to make you happy? Let's finish up today by <clears throat> affirming uh, that Christ is enough to make us happy. If you would look at Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 1. And what I want to do is I want to just invite you to humbly and fully once again, embrace the gospel of Jesus. Or if you have never have, embrace the gospel of Jesus to go ahead and do that now. Here's what Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and following says. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us at one time lived among them, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, has made us alive in Christ. It is by grace that you have been saved. Just a reminder that when we were in the world and when we thought that money would make us happy, success would solve our problems, that we were doing all that for our family, you remember the emptiness that that brought into your life. It's because we were believing the voice of the world, the voice that said, uh, it's going to take a lot more than Jesus Christ to make you happy. The gospel is, is that because of his great love, God has made us alive in Christ. So if you've never... <clears throat> Embrace this gospel before. Let me encourage you to do that now. You just can simply say, Jesus, I confess my sins and I ask you to come into my life with this grace and be enough for me. Finally, I want to just close it off with a few words for men who maybe have been bruised by the world. <clears throat> it's a psalm by Asaph, Psalm 73. I'm not going to read all of it, but some of the most important words in it. Surely God is good to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. Therefore, pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves with violence. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession of the earth. That is what the wicked are like, 
always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. And that's the voice of the world speaking. Uh, the world says it's going to take a lot more than Jesus Christ to make you happy. The psalmist says, surely in vain I've kept my heart pure. I, surely in vain I've been trying to push the voice of the world out of my head. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant, yet I am always with you. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. The sovereign Lord is my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. So men, when the world says it's going to take a lot more than Jesus Christ to make you happy, remember that you can reject that by not being conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You can take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ you can allow the lament here like Asaph has done in this psalm and then reaffirm that you have all you need in Jesus Christ to make you happy, more than happy. Let's pray. Our dearest Father, thank you for uh, your scripture. Thank you for the affirmation that you have come to uh, not fix the broken world, but rather to bring your gospel to us so that we might be liberated from our bondage to decay and death. Lord, when the world says it's going to take a lot more than Jesus Christ to make you happy, give us the uh, ability to reject that thought because we have, above all else, guarded our heart. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, men. Uh, next week, Brett will give a, a second lesson on the world, and then we'll move on to the flesh from there. Thanks. God bless you. Have a great day. have an entire new generation of men coming on the scene who need mentors. What we're trying to do at Man in the Mirror is we're trying to challenge men to use the Christian Man book and the coaching guide as a resource to mentor other men and then equip them to do it as well. This is absolutely an incredibly strong felt need for younger men. I just think having a formalized opportunity for guys to be mentored by more experienced guys is absolutely essential to the future of Christian manhood. So what we want to do is we want to show them, here's how you do it, and then when they have confidence, they will actually take action. My dream is, is that millions of men will mentor and coach millions of men who will be encouraged or challenged to then turn around and engage millions of men themselves. Hello, this is Tommy Beeland, pastor of the church in Butler. Thank you for watching this Man in the Mirror Bible study series. My prayer is that you've been challenged to become the strong Christian that God desires each of us to be. If you've tuned in and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I would like to pray with you and for you. I can be reached at the church office at 478-862-5966. If you don't have a home church, we'd like to invite you to visit us at any of our weekly services. Please come and join us. We'd love to see you. 
For more Man in the Mirror Bible teachings, tune in each week to your local Flint Cable, Channel 14. Thank you, and may God bless you as you grow in Him.